you ever stop to think about your food as a story? You probably have, because you're a restless native listener and we like to dive deep. Well, today's guest does too. She's gone from a non-hunter, which please do not take that as an anti-hunter. That's not what I'm saying. She's gone from a non-hunter to someone whose entire diet is made up of wild game. Now, I got to know her when she was from Danielle with Wild and Whole, but many of you today probably know her as Danielle from Meat Eater. Danielle has been on quite the journey as a food writer and chef, and in this interview, you'll you'll hear her talk about how she got started hunting, her journey as a chef, which I thought was really, really cool, and she gets some great cooking advice. And, you know, we even talk about how to take advantage of some of that freezer burn meat and like some of the, maybe the more fringe pieces, the stuff you might not know how to cook as well. Uh, she gets into a little bit of that too. There's a lot of really great cooking tips, cooking philosophy in here. And, and all above all that, it's just a great story. Now, as always stick around at the end of the show, I, uh, especially, you know, if you want to hear some news from go wild, we've got some um, really cool announcement. I like an actual big announcement. I'm not just teasing something for the sake of getting you to actually listen, but you should. Uh, however, you know, if you, I also want to call out that if you haven't subscribed to our channel or a podcast, please take a minute to do that now. You know, uh, we're delivering some awesome content. We've got some big plans this year and I don't want you guys to miss out. I want you to, you know, you obviously care about the restless native and, and the content we're putting out. So if you haven't subscribed, let's do that right now. All right, let's do this. I am your host, Brad Luttrell, and this is Restless Native with Wild Game Chef and Hunter Daniel Pruitt. Danielle, known you for a long time. I'm excited to get you on Restless Native. Hey, how are you, Brad? Doing well, doing well. It's uh, it's cool because I started um, Go Wild back in like, well, we started in 2016. I think you and I met originally in 2017, and I, I you know, started following along with your, your food blog, Wild and Whole, and... I've gotten to watch you like blossom into a really cool career. You're doing a lot of really cool stuff. So I'm excited to, to talk about all that. Yeah. Thanks. I think, um, when we connected, that was like one of the first, like I had barely been going, I don't even think I had been doing this for a year. So yeah, you were like one of my first contacts. Um, yeah. Through it, all of this. You were one of the first people into our app to kind of play. I think I'd ask you like, Hey, would you take a look at our recipe platform to see, yeah. see, uh, see what you think? And oh, gosh, it's changed so much since then. But, um, you, I think you were one of the, you beta tested, right? Do you remember? Yeah. I rem Yeah. I remember I was like, I'm not sure like what to put on here. <laughs> so I would just put random pictures of probably my dog or something. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. I, I don't remember either, but I remember, I think you were like one of the first 50 accounts we had because we were scouring yeah. trying to find people that would test it. And, uh, I found you and I found Jeremiah Dowdy from Field the plate. I don't know if you, uh, follow along with Jeremiah, yeah. But, but, um, yeah, you guys were kind of the two check boxes for me to like, okay, we get some feedback on recipes. That's cool. Yeah. Since then, you know, you've, um, your, your platform has really expanded and then, with a lot of the meat eater expansion hap that happened, I guess, was that uh 2018 or 19? When did, when did that happen? Um, it's been about two years now. Yeah. It, yeah. So I haven't been in 2018 late. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been a part of, been a part of meat eater for a couple of years now. Yeah. Since so meat eater went from like individual Steve Rinella to sort of, expand that brand um a little bigger it's been about a couple of years now yeah that's been fun to watch too so talk through like what your daily gig is now because you're doing um i know you still do some some content for wild and whole but a lot of your wild game recipes are living in, in the meat eater brand so can you talk through uh what your role is and and really meat eaters uh expansion into this online recipe focus yeah so um i uh, I'm the wild foods contributing editor for meat eater, which means I basically write <laughs> and cook for meat eater, um, recipes and just sort of produce content around any kind of wild foods, um, sort of making it not just about like venison recipes or wild game recipe, but sort of this like all inclusive world of getting outside and finding food is kind of what it's about um sort of just having that first-hand experience so i develop recipes write articles um some do some small appearances and podcasts here and there 
Um, and then I'm still operating Wild and Whole. That website is still alive. And I, I'm sort of um, moving that into a, a new chapter, which is really more about sort of self-sufficiency living, um, gardening. Like some of those aspects that come with gardening are when you have a successful garden, you have the burden of excess. And so like, as opposed to normal recipes where you're like, I'm going to go to the store and buy one squash and one pepper. Yeah. It's like, no, I've got 15, 20 squash. <laughs> what do I do with all these yeah. squash? So sort of kind of like some of that kind of stuff and then some foraging uh, mushrooms and, and a few more wild game things here and there. But so that's kind of my day to day operation is always outside trying to find food. <laughs> uh, I sent you a link to this and I, I won't judge you if you didn't listen to it. Cause there's just like, I'm, I'm in the same boat that there's so much content out there. I can't digest it all, but did you get a chance to check out the podcast I had with Alan Burgo? No, I haven't. I think you would really like it. Um, are you familiar with Alan? No. He, so he's the forager chef. I think his website is foragerchef.com. Oh, yeah, okay, I am. I'm yeah. familiar with his Instagram handle. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like he's like the, <laughs> the mushroom guru. And yeah. I did a show with this guy and I was expecting to mostly talk mushrooms, but we ended up going into this fascinating world of um, what he does as a consultant for farms to help them utilize the whole animal. Um, and he, he is a hunter, but he's kind of, I mean, he's, he considers himself more of a forager and chef. He loves to cook wild game. He's just not as much of a big game hunter, but that is one of my favorite podcasts I've ever done. And it's one of the the most downloaded we've ever had because people were just so into this guy that's like quirky and really into mushrooms. But um, it's it's really opened up. I have not taken mushroom hunting very seriously. I'm kind of like I look for them when I'm turkey hunting usually, and I never find any. I'm probably the world's worst mushroom hunter. <laughs> but Alan has a really cool resource on his website where he helps categorize the the mushrooms you can go through and use it as a, a resource and it has all the latin names and descriptions and he's got some links to recipes and stuff it's really cool so it's kind of I sparked love to hear that I it's really that. good i mean i and it's good because of him it's not like i mean i just sit and listen to him talk about mushroom yeah. hunting for for an hour and a half um it's yeah great. i'll have to check that out um i think i've i've seen his stuff on instagram before i follow him so i'll have to listen to it yeah. Um, and, and then uh, I'll say now, if you continue to hear weird stuff in the background, it's because we're in a pandemic and I'm recording from home. I don't know if you can hear the crying that is happening. I don't know what's going on outside my door. <laughs> I, I can't hear it. Do you have kids? No. just yeah. Two yeah. So you don't have like the wandering in of like a kid on a harmonica while you're in a podcast. That's, <laughs> I, I found, I found, uh, I gave my son my old harmonica and I'm, I'm regretting that. So yeah. That sounds like the worst to write it. <laughs> I'm totally going to give my best friend's kids a harmonica now. She's going to hate me. <laughs> yeah, it's like I, it's like I should have just gotten a drum set. Or, you know, <laughs> so, so sorry, I, I'm just disclosing. I don't know what's happening out there, but uh, it is on my end if you're hearing it. There's no child running around your house. Uh, so so you've, you've kind of taken that foraging aspect of Wild and Whole, and then with Meat Eater, you get, you're doing a lot of um, – I see a lot. I'm, I subscribe to, I think they started off as like a whitetail email list, but I'm kind of getting a lot of other stuff too. It's great. A great weekly email from Meat Eater. I guess it's weekly. Uh, but I see some of your stuff in there every now and then with recipes. I know you're, you're creating a lot of written recipes, but you've also moved to being on camera more and more too. What was that like, uh, you know, to go from like typing and there's, there's a di total difference between being able to, to be on camera and, uh, you know, command attention and entertain versus yeah. like creating really great recipes. What's that shift been like for you? It, it was extremely uncomfortable. To start <laughs> with. I'm a very personal person. And when I started wild and whole, I don't think for like at least six months, like I don't think there was a single picture of me on there just cause I was like, this isn't about me. This is about food. Just like stay out of it. And I realized, it doesn't really work that way because people want to know who you are and what your story is. And the more they understand like your personal life, uh, not like real personal, but just like who you are as a person, it becomes very relatable and approachable for, for all these things. And so I've kind of stepped in front of the camera, even though I didn't really want to just to, just to sort of get out, just kind of over, overcome a fear yeah. <laughs> of being on here a little bit um, because you shouldn't let stupid things like, like that um, inhibit your career growth. So um, 
yeah, and I'm starting to get a little more used to it. I'm still very awkward and weird, but um, it's it's allowed me to do a lot of cool experiences. So, like, um, we were recently, not recently, last fall in Idaho for checker hunting, doing a film. So that was the first time I was on film for a hunt. So that was definitely a little strange, but uh, you forget the camera name is yeah. there eventually. But yeah, it's it's fun. I uh, I obviously have no problem looking stupid on camera with this mustache. <laughs> like I, I can own it. Um, I, I will say like the podcast, uh, when I first started doing the podcast, you know, you, you grow up and it's weird to hear yourself on, on camera or on tape rather whatever it is any kind of audio format i i have lost that like I, eventually you just because I, I edit my own shows and uh, at a certain point like i i don't i don't even think i sound weird anymore and i honestly can't distinguish the difference between like what i'm hearing now and when i'm on tape um i guess it eventually just gets beaten out of you and i know a lot of radio guys that have done it way longer than i have you know that they kind of hit that same thing and um you know, there's, there is a bit of a, I guess you get so comfortable with it. It's, it's like, it's like, as if you and I are just talking now, like you're just casually uh, having conversation. It kind of becomes that with, it's so normal to start hearing it eventually. I haven't done as much on camera work as you all probably do with meat eater. I mean, you have a, a pretty big video platform obviously, but uh, when I, when I have done it, I, you, like you do settle into it eventually. And it kind of, they kind of, the camera guy kind of goes away. If it's a good camera guy, if it's a good camera guy, the wrong yeah. camera team, and you're like, oh my God, you're like in the way everywhere we go. <laughs> I, well, I've, I've been trying to do more cooking videos and those are all self-filmed and... That's tough. Uh, well, it's annoying because for one, you want to cook everything perfectly because it's on camera. But two, it's... That's not gotta, how cooking works. When you start to edit it, like you, you want to try to layer voiceovers and stuff, but to do that, then you actually have to say the voiceover. You can't just cook it. And then, and so it's like a lot of this, like moving cameras around in the middle of cooking. And like, if you could hear the outtakes, there's just like, shit, that, that, <laughs> knocking over. Cause I'm like in a tight space. Like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I should probably show those outtakes sometime. Yeah, that'd be that'd probably be that that'll be the video that goes viral. Everybody making fun of you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I always I I don't want to say I remind myself of Julia Child because that sounds really like egotistical. But like, what I've always adored her for is she's just like dropping things and she's yeah. like sort of like. What? And I, I'm very much like that in the kitchen. Everything is like, I'm always doing something really clumsy. <laughs> I, I like that with my podcast. Um, people, you know, they, they come in and um, we have a really good audio quality to the show. But at the same time, I'm not going to, you know, it's a conversation. This isn't one of those scripted shows where it's like, and next in this segment, we're going to talk about the top five things that Danielle uses in her kitchen. Don't do that. But, uh, you know, I was with the Sportsman's Alliance guys. Um, Brian and Evan came down to our Louisville office and we were, we were sitting around, we had some beers open and, and Brian cracked open a beer in the middle of the podcast. It literally, I don't know what, for some reason, IPAs in this fridge go crazy. It literally sprayed beer on the ceiling. It's going everywhere. And they're like, Oh my gosh, you know, it's like, whatever we left it in. <laughs> I didn't edit it out. It's funny. You know? Yeah. People, I think people enjoy that. Like real life. Connection, yeah. Not totally. Like, Cause when you edit things too much, then it, you, you just people just feel as if like I don't know I think we just have been in social media long enough that we're really sick of the uh, like quest for perfectionism and those yeah. things are really nice to see yeah the people that that do get really um like authentically well known like a Stephen Ranella like there yeah. there's personality there and that they're they let it roll and I, I think there's something to that um I know the people I look up to most in media aren't super hyper polished, you know, content creators. I look at people that, um, I feel a connection with, you know, Joe Rogan is a, uh, well, I mean, there's a lot of reasons Joe Rogan is what he is, but one of the things people connect with the most is that it's so raw, right? Like it's just a raw conversation. And I, I think there's something to that. Now you, you just said something that, um, kind of leads into, you know, you're talking about the authenticity behind being yourself and, you know, I, I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about, you know, we, we kind of established like th what you're doing with Meat Eater, but, um, you know, I want to talk about your past a little bit. And I know you're a bird hunter 
And I don't, I don't know that too many people have maybe want to hunt. Um, I've never goose hunted, but I've seen some of your recipes. No, I haven't. Um, I, I, I have a good friend in Michigan who's invited me and I need to take advantage of it. But, um, you know, you, your recipes that you were doing on wild and whole, um, and specifically there was a salad that you, you had that, uh, I think like, a, a, I think you serve it cold, like a sliced goose breast that cold. Um, maybe Probably. I think it's you. <laughs> that uh, sounds very likely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the, um, you know, you, you, you've, that's like not always who you've been. You've kind of been on this journey of a, uh, not an anti hunter or anything, but you weren't a hunter before. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about that and see if you can talk about this, um, you know, through your husband, you've, you've, you got into hunting and, um, I guess like if you could even go back far, like when did you start cooking and then talk about that transition into hunting a little bit? Because I mean, people know you now and you're showing how the proper way to fry venison and stuff with meat eater. You're creating all this hunting content, but take us back a little bit through your journey as a, as a chef and then as, as a content creator and in, in this hunting platform too. Yeah. So like I said, I, I say I didn't grow up hunting because I really didn't hunt, but my dad was a hunter. Uh, my dad's from South Dakota and he grew up hunting, um, pheasant hunting, deer hunter, fox hunt, duck hunt, like he was just sort of the kid where his parents gave him a gun and they're like, get outside, go play. I mean, that's, you know, 60s and 70s, a little different era. But um, so my dad was sort of raised that way. And a couple of times he took me uh, fishing and deer hunting and I just did not like it. Like at all I deer, just, deer hunting is a hard jump for people it's cold you're sitting oh my gosh like you get so bored you know, i get it deer stand there was i was sitting on a bucket and i remember a wasp nest in the corner and my dad's like all right be quiet and i'm like an eight-year-old girl cold with a wasp nest next yeah. to me <laughs> there's no way that's gonna pan yeah. out very well and like after that i was just like kind of done but I just, I just didn't understand the attraction to the whole thing. Um, and then fast forward, I went to school actually for fashion design. I have a degree in apparel design and manufacturing. Didn't see so that coming. Very, yeah, no, I have a very colorful resume. <laughs> it explains why your kitchen looks so great. My kitchen doesn't look like that. Can you come help me with my kitchen? <laughs> so, yeah, I have a, my background is actually in apparel design. Um, that's like really what my heart was set on um, it, through like my teenage years and going into college. And then by my senior year of college, which was actually my sixth year of college. <laughs> <laughs> You're just being very thorough, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> I've kind of had this sinking feeling of, oh my God, what am I doing? This isn't a career. I hate this. What am I like? I just like really had this freak out moment of what have I been doing the last six years? Because I had I gotten into like an internship, and um, after college, I started working in the industry, and I hated it. It just felt so empty and so um, just just a lot of hard work for very like little reward and then I mean not just pay but just there's something rewarding about that kind of work for me and so I just kind of felt like there has to be more I couldn't do this for the rest of my life and um so at that time I was like I just want to do over and I liked cooking so I started working in the classes at Sir Latov um they have I don't know if you've heard of them before um no. they're, they're a big old a chain company of a cookware store and in Houston they have a, a branch that has like a really big room with like several ovens and it, it's um, all hands-on cooking so we'd have like 16 to 7 18 people um, everybody all hands-on cooking and they each get their own burner and you're like kind of walking them through four different recipes um, through each class and so I was doing like three classes a day five days a week um we have rotating chefs in from all over houston and i just picked up so much i did that for a year 
and eventually towards the end, I was starting to teach some, um, started off washing dishes and ended up kind of teaching a little bit at the end. Um, and I really wanted to go to culinary school, but we got whisked away, whisked away to North Dakota and that changed everything. But that's really where I learned the foundations of cooking. Um, and then at that time, so I, the same exact time I um, had just gotten married and my husband is an avid hunter and fisherman. And so I kind of, growing up, food wasn't very important. That sounds terrible to say now, but it's, food was just kind of one of those things where you just eat to fill your stomach and that was, that was it. And so like when I met my husband and I remember butchering a deer with him and like how much care he put into it and then cooking it, like, like he made it a very special thing that he, we were having backstrap dinner. Like this is a very special thing. Um, and it just, it was, it really opened my eye, eyes to this idea that food is so much more than just filling your stomach. It has meaning and a connection to stories and memories. And there's just a lot more that it offers. And so since I was like falling in love with cooking, he was bringing all this game in. And I just thought this was so awesome because I get to go back to work. It was like sort of this thing where we'd all talk about what we cooked at home and everyone's trying to one up each other. And I got to cook all sorts of like game animals that nobody could buy. And I was like, suckers, I get the best, I get to cook the best stuff. And that's kind of where I like just had fun with cooking with wild game. But, um, my like actual philosophy and like the way I think about why I hunt has really evolved over the years. And it wasn't until we moved to North Dakota that, that everything changed. Um, I wouldn't say that was about eight years ago when we moved there. And, um, I started hunting. I, my first hunt was a pheasant hunt. It was negative 20 degrees. Oh my gosh. I'm out. And I remember <laughs> not being frozen on my face. My hair like was fro I thought my hair was gonna break off because it was frozen. It was horrible. <laughs> I didn't shoot anything. Um, but I kept going out. And of course, not all hunting days are that terrible. But you know, those are the ones you remember. <laughs> yeah. And um eventually I remember shooting my first pheasant. Um and then I had cooked pheasant a lot before because my husband was hunting. Um, but this was the first time to actually cook, cook something that I had shot. And so I just remember cleaning it and feeling just this deep sense of gratitude and appreciation and thought to myself, this is how you should feel when you're eating. Uh, it, just, it just felt amazing. And I wanted to feel that way all the time. And so... Um, we had the access to public land and like until then I had never really thought that it would be feasible to live off the land in that way. And at the same time I, I was, you know, reading Michael Pollan books, um, Omnivore's Dilemma and sort of kind of trying to grasp this understanding that everything we consume has some sort of consequence. And I found hunting to be a way to take responsibility for that. And for the first time ever, I was like, Hey, let's live off the land. Let's, let's like try to see if we can actually do this. And at first it was just kind of for fun. Um, and then like the more we did it, the more serious it became. Um, because up there you can hunt deer. We did a ton of waterfowl hunting, um, bird hunting, rabbit hunting. I mean, it's just like, I, I call it the year round hustle because hunting never ever ends. <laughs> it's kind of exhausting, but, uh, <laughs> But yeah, yeah that's kind of the story of how it all came that, together that was so good i um I, you know i always i prep a little bit for shows and that uh, i try to have play, a place i want to guide the conversation but i don't like i told you like i don't like to structure it but i had found a quote that was so good from you on your website and uh you just basically said all of that but more thorough and expansive than than you'd even got into on your website and what i the reason i, I brought that in you know you and i are similar in that and, um, I, I don't know, maybe I'll change at some point. People kind of evolve in their hunting, but I don't, I don't really care as much about like, like I'll, I'll get really excited about chasing a big buck that I have on trail camera, but I will 100% shoot the doe first. If I have 
an opportunity, even on like opening day of rifle season this year, I knew I had three big bucks in the area because I had been there the night before. And I, I just like, you know, for me, I knew I didn't have much venison left and I'm going to like, I wanted to fill my freezer first. And I, I have this like really strong connection to the, like that dough that I harvested. And there's a connection when I cook that versus pork chops that you would pick up at a grocery store that I don't know anything about. Well, there are probably some assumptions I can make of, of how that pig lived its life, but you know, mm-hmm. there's no, there's no connection there. And you, the way you talk about food, you have almost this spiritual connection to your food. And, you know, I really, I get that. And I, I love, I love processing as much as I love hunting. And I say that to some people and they like, they're like, well, that's weird. You know, they like no understanding of why I would feel that way. But, uh, you know, I take a lot of pride in, in really utilizing the whole animal, um, uh, as much as I can. And I'm always learning about how to do a better job of that. Um, but we still, you know, it, it, it's like easy for, I think it's easy for you and I to live in a vacuum and I'm not saying you do. I just like, sometimes I have to remind myself of like my experience and talking to people like Danielle and Jeremiah and people that do use, utilize the whole animal and that have this connection to their food. Like that's not all hunters. You know, we still have people that, yeah, it's like three piles. You got your back strap, you got your um, hams and you, here's your grind pile. Like everything else is going to the grind pile. Like, Oh, uh, what about the, the neck? No, that's too hard. Or what about the ribs? Like, Oh, there's no meat on that. And it's shanks are, you know, it's, it's too hard to cook. I don't, I don't, I'm just going to throw those out too. Like, and then organ meat, like totally an afterthought, right? There's, there's people that um, that's foreign to them. And I think this is shifting, but I'm also, I'm also curious what you would like, what conversation you would want to have with that audience. Like what, what, it, what do you say? Cause it's tough. You don't want to come in, you know, coming in guns blazing. I'm not saying this to be coming in guns blazing and judgy doesn't get you anywhere. Um, oh. and, and we're already closer to the, like this person already hunts. We just need to like get them to take another step for that full utilization. Like how do you, how do you get somebody past that, you know, grind it and grill it mentality to really look at the whole animal and, and utilizing it that way. You know, when I, when I first started and got into all this before I even actually, before I even hunted, I was processing meat. In fact, I shot my first eight years into hunting. I shot my first big game animal last fall, but up to that point, I can't tell you how many deer I've butchered and processed. Um, But when I started, well, one, I had no idea what I was doing, (laughs) like none. I couldn't tell you a single cut off the ham. (laughs) Um, And two, I just like did my basic Google search and it was like backstrap, tenderloin, grinding, chat. Okay. You know, like I was like, whatever. And so like I didn't save shanks. I didn't save the neck. So I definitely didn't save the heart and the liver and the call fat and the, all the sh- all that stuff so like i um i've been there um i have too for the record like i i definitely learned from some um the wrong people when i got into deer hunting um, yeah. and i've taken deer to processors and at the, even at the time like i've seen barrels filled with ribs that they were throwing out and it like kills me to think that that's going to waste you know i i just made korean barbecue with uh, the ribs off my dough from this year. And, you know, Hank Shaw's Korean barbecue recipe for uh, whitetail ribs is fantastic. Like it kills me that people would toss that out. Yeah. Um, So I think, I think when I like try to figure out like how do you, how do you connect the dots and like, how do you, you know, part of the problem is our society. When we go to the grocery store, you get the choice cuts. Like no one's like yeah. going to the, I mean, you go to the store to get pork ribs, but those are completely different ribs, you know? <laughs> <laughs> ribs. but you know, you're not going like, mm, let me have like the toughest cut you got, you know, like you don't do that. Um, and so I think that's kind of one of the things is like, we're just so used to just like kind of getting the choice cuts and you don't see in American culture, um, hearts and call fat and like you know like you just don't see that on a menu and so it's just very unfamiliar and you're like what do I do with it so I think one of the biggest hurdles is the education what what do I what cut is what how do I treat it like what do I do with it 
And so that's something that's really important for me to teach people. If I can contribute anything to this hunting world is how do you get the most out of your animal? And, you know, some people are not like me. They're not trying to like solely live off wild and game. And so like, that's not important to try to use the whole animal. Um, because they can go to the grocery store and get more meat. Um, I guess I just sort of have a different way of thinking that eating the whole animal is the best way to respect a life. But also I think I know from the cook's perspective that some of the gnarly bits, um, the unwanted bits will produce the best tasting dishes hands down. And so I think once you try it one time, your mind is just like, opened up to a world of possibilities you didn't know existed. Um, but yeah. That's like your Vietnamese dish um, that I told you recently I was making, you know, how many people throw out turkey legs? They just, oh, yeah. I mean, and I, I get it that it like seems hard and some people like people don't know. I do think you have to be like, there's a lot of people that grow up and that, that's how they were taught. And they, they probably think that you can't do anything with that leg because there's too many bones in it or it's tough. But, um, you know, I, I, the original recipe that you did was a, for pheasants, but I do I just made it the other day, um, braising a, a turkey leg and then, uh, you know, boiling it down and using it in that pho is easily my favorite way to eat a turkey leg. And, and um, honestly, the I, I ate those first, you know, I, that was my favorite. I was the most excited about the turkey legs off my bird this year. Um, and a lot of people would be confused by that if, if they haven't tried it before and um, slow cooked a turkey leg, they probably would think that they're hard to eat. And I do think there's, um, I think if you can show people, and this is something Steve's done a great job of, uh, I think Jeremiah has done a great job. I mean, I, I, I do th like Jeremiah Dowdy um, has been one of the biggest advocates for eating heart and and now like four years ago I didn't see a whole lot of people talking about hearts and his platform's kind of blown up and now every Valentine's Day it's the people holding out their hearts from their their big game animal and I don't I'm not saying he's solely responsible for that but I think the more you can show people the value in in those organs you're right like the um people people think about I, I I've seen like the call fat picture that everybody does you know Oh yeah. Let's see that. And they're like, what is that? I've never even seen that on an animal because if you're not careful when you're gutting, like you can cut right through that and not even know it was there. Right. Um, yeah. And a lot of people, they just don't know. And I'm not saying I know everything cause I surely don't. I, I've, I've, um, I'm, I'm, I would say I'm a relatively intermediary whitetail hunter and I've, I've not, it's not like I've killed or butchered uh, dozens and dozens, but um, I put a lot of time into learning from, people like you, Jeremiah, Steve, Hank Shaw, um, you know, Jesse Griffiths, like, like anybody I can learn from. And I, I just think that a lot of people don't hit that tipping point to where they're like, Oh, you know what? There's, there's another way I can, I can actually utilize these, these ribs or like, Hey, tongue. What if you could eat the tongue? Like that's a, that's a totally foreign concept to some people. Yeah. I think, I mean, how do you get to that point? I think, I, I have this theory that the harder you work for an animal, the more you appreciate it. You know, if you're sitting in a deer stand and you take the corn, I mean, in Texas, we have corn feeders. A corn feeder goes off and you shoot your deer and you, you know, you, you go, you clean it, you go to the butchers. Like you really don't spend a whole lot of um, effort compared to like some of my most memorable and most appreciative meals were like chucker hunting or you know you work incredibly hard at climbing mountains and falling and and or pheasant hunting in deep snow and like just you just work really hard for that animal and then when you actually do go to clean it and eat it you damn right i'm eating every little bit of that thing and yeah. i think there's a correlation between that not that there's anything wrong that you know that's not what I'm saying. That there's anything wrong with not not having a hard hunt and shooting a deer from a stand. That's there's nothing wrong with that. It's still putting meat in the freezer. But how do you get someone to like really care and want to try all those things? And I think you just each person is just going to have to sort of ask themselves like whether or not they want to utilize it or let it go to waste. Yeah, um, yeah, and um, you know a lot of whitetail 
effort goes in throughout the year and they're scouting and like a lot of that effort comes the day before you show up to that stand. But then I do know a lot of people that they show up to the stand that day, they shoot it, it's in the truck and it's at the processor three hours later. Right. Like that's definitely, um, that definitely happens quite a bit. All right. So, um, speaking of kind of utilizing that whole animal, something, something I wanted to talk about with you was, you know, we're, um, at the time of this airing anyways, that will be coming into summer. And a lot of people have put some distance in between when they may have shot an early season deer or even, even, you know, your, your November bucks that people have gotten. There's some parts that have kind of been sitting in the freezer and, and some yeah. people will save this stuff and they just don't know what to do with it. Right. Your, yeah. your, pre, your primo cuts uh, are, are maybe gone or you're kind of getting down into some of that organ meat. You saved a heart, but you don't know what to do with it. And I wanted to talk, through with you like maybe maybe some of your favorite ways to prep and we'll get into some other um, thoughts on the freezer too but like on some of these these cuts like maybe the shanks or if you do have tongues or ribs how do you look at those what what are some of the ways that you're getting creative and utilizing some of these um we won't we won't call them anything to uh uh they're they're lesser they're a little more uh challenging to cook i would say because and some of that is just because there's fewer resources out there on, on cooking them so when you approach a shank or a ribs what what's your approach what do you what, how would you be using that stuff this summer well, so it's funny how you say like everyone eats the choice cuts first and then like summer rolls around and you've got all these you know uh, things you don't know what to do with or tough cuts i guess um what's funny is i Maybe this will help somebody next fall. When I um, start eating a deer, I always start with the tough cuts because it's fall. It's winter. You want to eat those hearty braises. Like the best way to treat those shanks, neck, uh, shoulders is to braise it. And um, it just tastes better to eat a braise in the, <laughs> in the winter. And then summer rolls around. You're like ready to fire up the yeah, grill. I got true. stick on the grill. So that's kind of the way I approach it. But that's not to say that I don't have a shoulder in my freezer still. Um, so, like, some of those cuts, you know, the best way to tenderize it is to cook it low and slow. And there's a few ways you can do that. If you wanted to braise it, you would basically brown it, put it in some sort of liquid, either in the oven or into a crock pot. And a great way to sort of make that seasonally appropriate is to, like, do a barbecue. So like, um, I, uh, take, I love doing this with necks, but you can do this with any roast, brown it. Oh wait. Okay. Back up. Back up. <laughs> so I my own barbecue rub and then I season almost like you're going to brine meat, but instead of putting it in liquid, I just rub the whole thing in my barbecue rub 24 hours, just let it chill out in the fridge. And then I brown it on the skillet. And then I'll put it in a crock pot or something like that. Add like um, some apple cider vinegar, um, some little stock, some onions, and um, you have all that sort of barbecue flavors going in there. And then I just let it go all day. And then you've got pulled barbecue. That's kind of the simplest ways to do it. Another method of low and slow that's basically the same thing is smoking it. It's a low temperature for a long period of time. It's the same cooking principle, just a very dry method. So um, if you wanted to try that, sometimes it's nice to start it on the smoker for a few hours just yeah. to infuse that smoky flavor and then wrap it up and finish it in the oven or a crock pot so it can sort of reabsorb those juices without drying it out. I do my pork butts like that. You know, a lot of people are opposed to that because they like the bark, but I don't, you know, a pork butt makes so much meat that typically I'm going to have leftovers anyway. So you're only going to get that bark one time. And I don't, I don't think the bark is worth losing the moisture. Um, what's your, what's your preference on that? that? The bark, I come from barbecue land here in Texas. Yeah. Um, you know, bark is great, but when you're comparing the barbecue you're having at, you know, wherever, those are animals with a whole lot of fat to them. So like yeah. you're, you're getting um, a completely different mouthfeel. You may have that like rich bark, but you're also buying into a lot of fat. Yeah. Wild game doesn't have that. And so for me, I feel like I'm just eating something that's just, it, there's nothing to counterbalance the bark. Yeah. Um, and like you said, it's kind of only good that first day you had it hot 
and then like leftovers are kind of like, <laughs> yeah. What do you, uh, do you add anything when you, I think they call it the Texas crutch. That's what I've always heard it called. When you wrap a, a pork butt or a brisket or something, you know, you're kind of pushing it through that stall on a smoker. I used to run, I would wrap mine and leave it on the smoker, but I've, I'm, I've kind of realized over the years, I'm like, this is stupid. I'm wasting my charcoal and there's no added smoke value. So I actually take it and put it in the oven at that point. Yeah, that's, I don't do a whole lot of smoking. My father-in-law loves smoking, but I'm pretty sure he, he does the same thing with his brisket. Smoke it, um, wrap it in foil, and finish it in the oven. It's kind yeah. of, the, I don't want to say it's a cheater method by any means. You're still putting a lot of energy into it, but. It, it, well, the biggest thing it does. Yeah. The biggest thing it does is, um, you know, and this is not really wild game even. A lot of people are doing this with like store-bought pork butts or briskets. And the biggest thing it does is avoids that stall. Like when they just, I mean, they, they hit 165 and that fat starts rendering and they just cool down. You, you'll lose temperature and it can take three extra hours, uh, yeah. which, which can be brutal. <laughs> um, I, I am of the opinion, and um, this is just on my experience too, I feel like after about six to eight hours you're not really taking in a lot more smoke i don't you're not going to get much deeper pen penetration than that either so that's been my experience um but yeah. when you if you were to smoke a roast um and depending on the game like i find that i can't do a long smoke on a venison um ham because it's just like it's going to get to a point where it starts to get too far like it's going to cook faster it's not like a 10 pound pork butt right so yeah. I, i'll do a couple hours on something like that if you were to move it into the Texas crutch, like you're going to move it to the oven, do you add anything to that? Like I heard you say like apple cider, or do you add any apple jelly? Is there something like that for that barbecue approach? Um, you know, I'll be honest. I don't smoke a whole lot. I think I'm very sensitive to smoky flavors. And so if there's anything too smoky, I just immediately like. <laughs> I feel like you're eating a tree. <laughs> yeah. And like, honestly, I'll have barbecue like once every four months here yeah. in Texas because it's just so much everywhere fun. yeah all right well, let's talk about something you do cook a lot of uh, <laughs> i get excited about barbecue I, I i make a ton of barbecue i have a big green egg i love barbecue uh, yeah but but let's talk about like you know what are the, some of the other the shank what are um are there summer ways besides barbecue your, your ribs or um even your steaks are there in, like ways that you're doing that a little differently give some advice on whatever might be left in people's freezer at this point um Tongues are a great one, if, you, if anybody saved their tongues. Um, my favorite tongue recipes are always kind of summery. Um, you can like tacos? Summer, yeah, you can do lingua. But I feel like when it comes to, like, if, you've, if you shoot one deer, you've got one tongue. Yeah. Like, you're getting a taco, taco for one. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you know, I kind of, I don't always, unless I, like, save up a bunch of tongues or we just have more my friends or someone like gives me a tongue or something like um that's the only time i make tacos is if there's enough to f make a taco for multiple people which is kind of rare but if you've got one tongue i'll just um simmer it until it's tender slice it thin peel it peel the skin off slice it really thin and then i just put some sort of like paprika like a sweet kind of like a paprika, chili, brown sugar rub on it. And then just give it a really quick sear and then serve it with chimichurri sauce. That way, if you have people over, it's more of an appetizer and everybody gets to just, it's also more pro approachable for someone who's like trying tongue for the first time and they're like really not excited about it. It's like just this one bite. That's all you have to try. And you're like, oh, that's actually really awesome. Yeah. Uh, you, instead of like a whole taco, you're getting like a mouthful of tongue. <laughs> like yeah, it's yeah. You I, know, it's just kind of smaller. <laughs> I feel like um, I think it's your site. I think I, don't you have a whole dove grilled grilled dove recipe with chimichurri? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great chimichurri. Is that on? Uh, that's on your Wild and Whole blog, that's right? On, yeah, wildandwhole.com, and that one I add radishes to it. Yeah. Radish chimichurri. I that is, that. um, that's my favorite chimichurri recipe. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, paleo MG. Um, I can't remember her name now. Julia, I don't know. She's, she has a huge platform, um, for paleo food, which I'm uh, a fan of. I, 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 I might know who she is. Yeah. She, 
her, her blog, um, her recipes are fantastic. Uh, she has the best paleo recipes I've found and she has a really good chimichurri, um, recipe as, as well, but I really like yours. Maybe it is the radishes that brings in a little bit of kick to it. Um, it's got more texture, I think. Yeah. Well, I'm all about texture. I think mm -hmm. people overlook the importance of texture when, mm -hmm. when you're eating. Um, it's not just about taste, but the yep. texture is a big one. I, I agree. Um, what? How do you? How do you? I keep bringing up ribs. I I would. I only have one way I do ribs. I do Hank Shaw's uh, Korean barbecue recipe. What, how do you utilize your your ribs off a of big game animal? I do the same way that I like the crock pot method. I was telling you with the neck. Mm-hmm barbecue rub um well actually that's a little different i started um kind of like a reverse sear kind of mentality of i start start braising it until they're tender and then take it off and then uh rub it in oil and then slap it on the grill for a few mm. minutes yeah yeah but cool. you have the best of both worlds so um, something, something we kind of mentioned before we dove into this show was you were talking about like at this time of year, a lot of the game can have freezer bite or, or, or um, you know, frostbite. Um, and you know, how are, when, when you pull that out, a lot of people, uh, are inclined to say it's no good, but how are you addressing that when, when you pull something out? If it's got like, how do you, how do you, you know, it's always kind of heartbreaking to, <laughs> to find a piece that's really got it bad. Yeah. What do you do with that when you find it at this point? Yeah, that happened to me last week. So, like, I think I'm the worst about, like, keeping meat in there, not because I don't want to eat it, but because it might be the very last pheasant or, like, the last of the goose. And it's like somebody said once, it's like, I hate eating that last package because it feels like the hunt's over. Like, I just want to, like, yeah. it, and then I want to, like, it's a special occasion, like, that last yeah. bird from that hunt or whatever. Um, and then you go and you defrost it and it's, it's frostbitten and you're like, I wasted it. What was I like? Don't do that. I, tell, yeah. but, I mean, I still make that mistake all the time. I pulled a package of a uh, goose breast out and they were pretty frostbitten. And like my word of advice, when you're trying to clean out your freezer, always, eat anything with skin or fat attached to it so like ducks and geese particularly if they're really fatty that fat goes rancid way faster than venison does because venison doesn't have that same type of fat um and so that's like really when you're thinking about frostbitten meat like that's kind of what you're where you're coming from is a the smell of the rancid fat um so keep that in mind but i pulled some geese out that smelled pretty pretty bad <laughs> but I ended up um seasoning it with creole for 24 hours again I'm I'm kind of repeating the same method over and over because I believe salt can work wonders on wild games so yeah. I tried to apply either just plain salt or some sort of rub 24 hours before cooking especially if it's got an off flavor to it so I did it at like a homemade creole blend and then I made gumbo and it was it was fantastic. Yeah, um, that's a that's a really good recipe for anything that tastes a little frostbitten. Um, so is like curry, anything that you're gonna get like a lot of big bold flavors. I hate to say cover up the flavor, but that's really what you're doing. Yeah, um, yeah. It's kind of funny. I um, my my wife is like the biggest case study for me on that bold flavor of game, you know, she, she, her family's from Chicago. They, they didn't really, um, I mean, they've never eaten venison really until I've, I've been serving it since I, we host parties and stuff with them. And, and slowly I've gotten people to try it. And my wife, um, when I first started cooking, um, cooking venison, I, well, yeah, I was not good at it. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I cooked it like steaks, like a lot of people do. And it, it sucked. It was dry. It was uh, bitter. And, so that was her first impression. And it's, t it's like, I did more damage up front and I had to overcome and try to convince her it was good. And now she likes it. And, um, in her opinion, I cook it better and it doesn't taste gamey. But in my opinion, like if I had a steak now, I'm like, it's kind of boring, <laughs> so, you know? And I think there's so much of a adjustment, uh, and getting used to it to where, to where really like we, we get used to eating corn fed animals that are, 
and, and a lot of depending on where you are, you're deer eating corn too. But yeah. the uh, the we eat a lot of animals that just live on corn, and that's all they're fed, and and it's like a sweet taste of the meat. There's nothing else there because there's no variance in this diet, and I think like our perception of what meat even is is wrong. And Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that was like one of the first thing I noticed was wild game has flavor. And then once you start eating it for a while, then like you start eating anything else, you're like, this is so bland. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think that's one of the reasons where I fell in love with wild game because when you go and you buy meat at a grocery store, you know exactly what you're getting and exactly what it's going to taste like. There are no surprises. Yeah. And there are always surprises with wild game. And I think that's so fascinating that we have this unique opportunity to try something new all the time. I guess from a chef's perspective, it's just so, so much fun. Um, I think people look at that as like a very, like, like a, like a negative. Yeah. Like people think when they're like, oh, wild game has all these surprises. We're like, oh, that's terrible. And I'm like, that is just, that's awesome. The fact yeah. that we try that i think is really really cool yeah and um you know the challenge too of like we've been talking about of eating the entire animal different cuts taste so different we just you don't get that experience at the grocery store uh, ha have you all at meat eater tracked any of um i feel like i've seen some of this in your all's newsletters and you may not be as involved in this but in your all's research are you thinking more people are going to be hunting this year you know i don't know I mean, we've kind of like talked about like, are you talking about because of the pandemic and like, yeah, I mean, early numbers seem to indicate that the, there will be a lift this year. I mean, there's been record yeah. numbers of licensed uh, like classes and uh, licensed sales in certain areas. Yeah. And it's, it's too early because we don't know if that'll maintain, but it seems like it should be. I was just kind of curious if you all like what you all think about I think it. Really? I mean, maybe some of the other guys have dived into this a little deeper and, and I don't know, but, um, I think the cons general consensus maybe is just might vary by location. Yeah. I think certain locations are going to have better access, easier hunting opportunities than other places that have very limited access. Um, Texas is a tough place to get into it. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. It's like they're 2% of, or 4% even of public land or whatever it is. It's like, yeah, that's a lot of acres, but Texas is so big. You got to drive like, you know, there's, it's spread out. Um, and if you want to do leases, the, there's so much competition that the leases are really expensive. Yeah. Um, and I think part of the reason why I didn't really, I mean, even my dad grew up hunting in South Dakota, but he didn't really hunt a ton in Texas. And we've just always kind of considered it a rich man's sport. Yeah. Uh, because leases, I mean, seven thousand, ten thousand dollar hunting leases. It, that's shoot a deer. Like it's just crazy to me. Yeah. Um. It's a it's a lot of money. So like if you if you don't have land access, it's challenging. And I put in for a handful of public land tags, and I didn't apply everywhere, but just sort of the the key places I wanted to actually hunt in, and I didn't draw a tag. I mean, there's just a lot of people trying to apply for those small areas of land, and then there's a, a big section of our public land on the east is um, pretty swampy and can be, like, mosquito-infested. It's, like, not, like, the most enjoyable hunt <laughs> if you do draw on that unit. So, like, I knew I was, like, I'm just not applying over there because I just – alligators and <laughs> yeah, I just don't <laughs> that. but um but i mean there is you got to do a little driving um there is there is public land hunting you can make it happen we've made it happen of course we've also been applying to new mexico yeah i i really love hunting in new mexico we went there twice three times last year and wow. plan to go back this year so new mexico. Are, are you living back in texas yeah, yeah, I live in Texas. I missed the part where you came back. I, uh, oh, I didn't say that? Okay. No, oh, if you did, if you did, I, I missed it. But, um, no. okay, are, are you back in Houston? Yeah, I, yeah, cool. we moved from Houston about two, almost two years ago. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like Houston. Um, I've been down there a couple times and, and yeah. really enjoyed it. It's spread out as I'll get out, but uh, it's, like, so massive. 
Texas in general, it just takes forever. It's so funny. Um, when I've been down there and I went to Texas a lot last year, I was in Dallas a lot and I would talk to people and they're like, Oh yeah, I live down the road. And I'm like, where are you? Like in Houston. It's like people, people in Texas also have this mindset of like, well, everything's far away. We have to drive like, like there's a different, there is that mindset where, Oh, four hours. No big deal. I'll drive over there. Like at least a lot of people I've talked to. Whereas in Kentucky, we're like, Oh, four hours. That's across the state. (laughs) Yeah. The four hour thing, like, like some of the areas that I want to forage for mushrooms is, well, I I went to um, an, an hour away and found mushrooms, but most of the, like the prime foraging area is three hours away. And I was just like, do I really want to drive three hours (laughs) to do that? Um, but yeah, like we went to Lubbock for, for some bird hunting. That's a haul. (laughs) It does like now nine hours. Yeah. That's, that's a, yeah. You guys, you guys are a different breed down there though. There's definitely, um, and I'm not saying in a bad way or a good way. I think it's uh, it's just like people in Texas. There, there's certain attributes to them. I'm like, it's yeah, different. it's a different place. The Yeti's obviously based in Texas. And uh, the last two days, I've been watching a film series that they're doing with Ryan Bingham, a Texan. Are you familiar with Ryan? Yeah. Yeah, you listen to this stuff. So um, yeah. he's got one with uh, God, what's the guy's name? Alan, um, Terry Allen, and um, they they. they Alan? Terry mm-hmm. Allen, uh, singer. Um, so he, there's a special that, that Ryan Bingham, um, does it's like 30 minutes long, but it's about what Bing from Texas did for their music. Really cool piece. You should check it out. If, uh, if you're into like Ryan Bingham's, um, Oh yeah. Album. I love Ryan Bingham. Yeah. I, I tell you what I, I watched, uh, he had one with Margot Price and I love Margot. Um, and, and then I was like, this is really good. I wonder if they did any more. And then there's two, two more, uh, Terry Allen and then, um, um, Jack Johnson. So like yeah. totally, totally different direction, but I like Jack Johnson too. So yeah. it's really I like good. Jake and Zan's got a great podcast and I think yeah. he's intermingled and all that. Yeah. That's another really cool thing about Texas is the coast coast fishing is so like, we may not have like the best, like the public land access, but, but people forget that we have a coast. Yeah. And you can just do some of the world's best fishing out yeah. there. I'm um, jealous of that. I would, I would, um, it would not take much if I lived near a coast to convert me into more of an angler, you know, Kentucky, yeah. we just don't have the, I mean, even when I go up to Michigan with my, my friend uh, and fish on the big lake, like the, the, the catch is just so much more quality. It's not like we don't have stuff here. It's just, I find hunting to be more rewarding with my time. So, um, yeah. I, I like fishing. I just kind of suck at it. I need to, I need to like really focus and get better. <laughs> I suck at it too. So, live fisherman. Luckily he's good at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> go for the views. <laughs> All right, Danielle. Um, what are, what's on the horizon? Like, what are you, uh, what are your, your goals for the, uh, yourself? Like, what are you focusing on? with with meat eater and wild and whole over the next couple of years you know you, you've really got a great platform now to to really to get your content out there so what are you going to be focusing on as, as you continue to well, I, I grow? I two focuses i work directly under meat eater and so watching the culinary space expand has been really exciting to sort of be a part of it lead it um and just sort of watch that grow and we have some cool partnerships coming up um, with some new products coming out that I'm really excited about um, promoting. And then on the wild and whole side, uh, that website is also going to expand hopefully in the future. Um, with, like I was saying earlier, with a, a little bit different of content that's um, more geared sort of a little bit outside of the hunting world. And so I think, um, for me, one of my one of my primary goals, I've always just had this idea, this fantasy that one day I would live in a world where there was not the segregated uh, domestic wild game. I feel like the moment you start sharing wild game recipes, you're like funneled into the shoot. And I, I just don't see things as so black and white. And I just think that there's a lot more room for uh, opportunity and other people to to come into the to this world. Um, so that's what I'm, that's what I'm excited about. 
Awesome. Well, where, what, what are the best ways for people to follow along with you, your blogs? Can you tell us, tell us where to find you? You can find me mostly on Instagram, um, wild and whole and also Facebook wild and whole <laughs> <laughs> nice and simple. Or do, do you have a, do you have two Instagram accounts though, right? Or am I, I have a personal one, Danielle Pruitt. So less food on there. So wild and holes where people want to follow your, your recipes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, I'm kind of changing the way that I operate those two, but under my personal one will be more of just sort of the, you'll see a lot of stuff that I'm doing with meat eater and more of sort of like thing, more, more personalized information versus wild and hole will be va strictly wild and hole stuff. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. I'll put links to that stuff in the, uh, in the show notes. So, uh, anything I didn't ask you about that you wanted to throw out there for the show? I don't think so. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming on and talking about this. I, I yeah. love, I love talking about food, even though you don't do barbecue. I do, but I'm going to, I'll do more barbecue. I just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I'm I just kidding. Barbecue. I'm just kidding. You're, I, oh, I'm, I love it as much as other people. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all right. I, um, I, I love it quite a bit. And, uh, but I, I will say you have some really great recipes that people should check out. I've, I've cooked several of them. Um, I got to go get a goose now so I can try out your, your, I think it's your goose salad. You've, I, I'm thinking it's there. So yeah, it? there's a lot of goose recipes. Yeah. That first year that we like decided to live off the land, we didn't shoot a deer. So we, um, got into spring conservation season and had like a hundred geese that year <laughs> so I <laughs> like three times a week yeah but there's one called steakhouse goose so for your first goose that's what you should make all right well maybe if i i sort of say if i if i make it happen september but I, i'm having a baby this fall so my whole hunting season is oh. i'm not that'd be weird but my wife is <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, thank you uh a baby during a pandemic. We'll see how it goes. But, um, yeah, yeah my hunting season is, um, I may have kind of screwed up my next few hunting seasons on the timing here. So we'll, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> it'll be, it'll be fine. One day, one day, take them honey. I'll yeah. Them. Yeah. Um, so, all right. Well, thank you so much for coming on and, and talking. This was awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Bye. All right. Thank you, Danielle. That was a really fun chat. I really enjoyed getting to talk to her. It's the first time I've actually gotten to sit down and talk to Danielle. I've known her for a while. We've, we've talked through social media as you do, uh, emails even, but um, it was fun to get to sit down and actually get to know her a little bit more. And I, I really appreciate her taking time out of her schedule with two different platforms that she's creating content, you know, to come on and talk to us and to share a little bit of her story. All right. I'm going to remind you again, if you haven't subscribed to Restless Native on your podcast platform or on YouTube, Please do, please do that now. And if you listen to this on a podcast, remember we are streaming this on YouTube now. So uh, it's an evolving effort, but, uh, and there'll, there'll even be a couple more that come out that aren't video per se, but we'll still put them on YouTube. Um, but we're, we're transitioning to have really to be on both platforms. And then we're going to focus on actually growing the show a little more. I'm trying to give restless native the much needed love. There's so much great content there. And in a lot of ways, like my attention is so focused on go wild that I sometimes forget to promote this awesome show. Like I get to talk to so many incredible people like Braxton McCoy or Alan Burgo, which was one of the most popular podcasts I've, I've done. Maybe ever and you know the guy talking about mushrooms and you know sometimes we it's like a uh, a candle hidden under the bushel basket we forget to forget to share it and tell people about it um, so here's a little secret for you guys moving away from restless native altogether go out has launched a desktop platform where you can log in to the social platform i'm super pumped about it i will tell you uh in some ways it is like the uh, stepchild of the, the the Go Wild platform family right now. It's new. You got to understand what state this is in. There's no gearbox. It does have some limited functionality, uh, but it's all the social. You can comment. You can post. Um, you can you can upvote. You can interact. Uh, there there are some limitations with like being able to see some of the long form content. That's quickly getting fixed um, or added. Really, it's not that it's broken. We just haven't done some of this stuff yet. I mean, we don't do things. 
It's not, I always tell people it's not like going to your favorite Chinese restaurant where you say, I'll take the A2 and an egg roll. That's not how this works. We build everything from scratch. We make sure our technology is top of the line. We, we do not make sacrifices. And sometimes that means we launch later than, than we wanted to. Sometimes it, it means that projects are taking longer overall. And, and, you know, maybe you have to make a sacrifice on the timeline that you want. And which is what happened here. I thought this was going to launch a while ago, but, you know, we, we had a big, um, challenge to recreate what we had done on mobile. I think the mobile app is fantastic. Um, I, I think it, the, I'm so proud of the team and what they've built up to now. But they had a years years head start on on our team for building out this web application. And uh, I, I find myself enjoying the web application more and more. I think you guys are going to like it too. I'll tell you, it's buggy. There's stuff you're going to find with it. We've got a nice, easy, built-in way to report the bugs. Uh, and please do that. You all know, I mean, we evolve very quickly. We update every week for the most part. Um, the the website will be updated uh, weekly going forward, which is good. It's good to get in a rhythm and to be able to start, you know, keeping it in in line with the rest of our development efforts. It's gonna be cool. So uh, go to time to go wild dot com to try it out. You'll see a login up in the top in the menu. It's the first thing in the menu. So we haven't fully announced this yet. Uh, this is today is June second, and it's kind of just sitting there. It's a, it's like kind of a soft launch. Some of the ambassadors we work with have tried it out, the influencers. So um, go try it out and see what it, see what you think about it. Let us know. If you don't like it, that's cool. Like I want to hear that. I want to hear your feedback on it. So please tell me, tell me what you thought about it. Um, beyond that, you know, we do have a really, really big announcement coming on uh, something that I've been working on with the whole team. So I can't tell you what that is, but I'm excited about it. And I kind of want to tell you more, but I can't really without giving it away. So that's it for today. I'm out.